You can imagine what a true uh, honor and pleasure it's for me to be here. I think Father Emmett uh, uh, talked about my first paper on this problem was 75. And uh, this is the 45th year of my starting to work on this climate change issue. It's been a long road. <clears throat> and about five years ago, it, it sort of became clear to me the only way we are going to solve this problem is for scientists to form an alliance with faith, science, religion, and policy. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about. Let me start with my conclusions. I'm going to show you some evidence we have to justify such drastic statements that climate change can reach crisis levels in about 10 years. <coughs> so what do I mean by crises? Right now, bad things are happening to people 100 miles away. For example, uh, yesterday uh, I was in Los Angeles in my daughter's house. The fire with they're talking about was within two miles of her house. And uh, it's happening campfire, it's happening in Florida. But when it reaches crisis levels, it's going to be in all of our living rooms. And I think somehow I find uh, as society, we have lost the ability to feel compassion for people who are not around us, right? So we're not feeling it. But everyone would start feeling it. It will be in our living rooms in varieties of ways. So we have about 10 years to come to grips with the problem and bend the curve. And I'll tell you how we can do that. The biggest thing that's happening towards solving the climate change problem is not coming from people like me. It's not coming from citizens in terms of adults. It's coming from children. The youth movement is the biggest Oh, I see. Okay. That shows everyone can play a role in this. This happened in 2015. I was blessed to be a part of this. That's the publication of Laudato Si, the encyclical letter by the Holy Father, Pope Francis. I think translated to English, it's care for a common home. Without any exaggeration, I can tell you this is the best document ever published on climate change. Not only the science, but the human dimension of it. Although I've been working on this 40 years, it's after uh, reading this document, I fully comprehended the human tragedy that it is. Okay, I, I would suggest all of you, please, Give it a look. If you don't have time, just spend half to one hour quickly going through the pages. So people say, uh, oh, I don't have the background for this. You know, I was not trained in this field. So I wanted to tell all of you, I tell them when they say that they don't have the background. I'll tell them, I'll tell you what my background was. That's my grandfather's village house. His house got destroyed. <coughs> And that's a neighbor's house. I visited it when I was 60 years old. And you see those kids. I've never seen happier kids, right? And I was that topless kid. I spent about 14 years sitting on that veranda, watching the days go by. So why were we blissfully happy? There was no homework. <laughs> there were no parents telling us what to do. You can't watch more than half an hour TV. That's what my children do to my grandchildren. So why did that topless kid come to America? I'm going to give you my reason. It will completely disappoint you. 
It's not to pursue higher studies. It's not to do research. It definitely was not to do climate change science. <laughs> Interestingly, it's not a joke, that was my true reason. I had this dream that I'm going to go to America, quickly get a degree, whatever it takes me to make some money, buy a Chevy Impala, go home to my hometown as a hero. I would have become welcomed as a hero if I'd driven with the Chevy Impala. <laughs> But I never got to buy that Chevy Impala because the climate change, even then it became clear to me. But instead, the science I did got me something much, much better. Uh, this was uh, in 2004. I was turned 60 years old. After I visited my village, I went to the Maldives. I was doing a study with aircraft, looking at pollution. And we were in a small village in Maldives. I was in the uh, village chief's house. He had three wives. Unfortunately, the third wife left him when I was there, so I got her room. <laughs> it's very comfortable. And the thing I loved that room was it had Wi-Fi. So after launching this aircraft, I still vividly remember that I go come home, I always check my email before I go to bed. And uh, I, in the, the letter the email started a first sentence, uh, Vatican, and then Pope John Paul II. What would you do? I thought it was a spam email and deleted it. <laughs> Somehow, uh, in the night, I was restless. I got up in the morning, and it said I was admitted uh, <clears throat> to the Pontifical Academy of Science. I had not heard of this academy, and <clears throat> that I should come within uh, two or three weeks to get uh, inducted to that academy. We addressed directly uh, the Pope. We served him in this academy. Honestly, without any exaggeration, I belong to all the major academies in the world, including the Nobel Academy, which awards the Nobel Prize. This academy is the best scientific academy I am in. The main thing I would say, out of the 80 members, 30 are Nobel laureates, and you are chosen just for your science. Uh, it's multiracial, we are from many countries, and it's non-sectarian. I didn't know that. And uh, there is a basement inside the basilica where a service is done. Sometimes the Pope personally comes. So we go to the service for nearly 10 years. Every time I walk down the narrow stairs and sit there, I said, now they're going to find out I'm not a Catholic and they're going to kick me out. <laughs> So uh, I'll tell you how I found out it was non-sectarian. Was uh, uh, Pope Benedict gave me the unique honor of uh, becoming a council member. There are seven of us who run this academy, and we elect new members. That's when I learned we never ask questions about what race this person is, what are their religious belief, just science. What science have they done? Does it deserve to be something we can advise Pope Francis, through Pope Francis, a billion or more Catholics? And I want to show you, uh, I never ever got my Chevy Impala, but I'll tell you I, what I got something much better. And this came personally from now uh, Saint uh, Pope John Paul II. And he put this on me personally with his blessings. All members of the academy get this chain and when we visit the Holy Father, we wear this chain to show our solidarity as scientists with religion. 
So, uh, this is my Chevy Impala. <laughs> I want to quickly take you uh, for the next 10 minutes on the science of climate change. How do we know what we know? Why are scientists like me coming to the public and saying, we are at a crisis stage? Those words, crisis, it means so much for a scientist. We need backing. We can't use these <coughs> kind of words loosely. My own work was. Uh, when I joined NASA after I got my PhD, I went back to India. I had worked on Mars and Venus. And I went back to India, and my father tells me, son, w w what have you been doing the last four years? I was telling proudly about the greenhouse effect of Venus and Mars. He looked at me, and then he looked at me. After about five minutes, he says, I think you should go back to America. Only that country is rich enough to pay for such useless work. <laughs> <laughs> so I came back to the US. And uh, so I learned quickly about what was happening. The whole science of climate change started really 100 years ago by a famous uh, Swede, Swante Arrhenius, <clears throat> showed the first work how carbon dioxide could heat the planet. So I teamed up with NASA to design satellite studies, the experiments to really directly measure it. So the satellites gave us an idea from you know, high above what was happening. But there were several parts we needed to test. So I designed the aircraft. This one is uh, uh, UAV drones. <clears throat> we designed it for 12, 14, 13 years ago. Sort of wing, wing tip to wing tip, it's about six feet. And we miniature a lot of instruments and really directly measured how, when you drive a car, how that gas which escapes, how it heats the planet. So, uh, you know, this was three aircraft flown simultaneously to do an, an MRI scan, right? And even the military had not done it. It was done 10 years ago. So uh, in some circles, I'm called the super spy. <laughs> if you are polluting the planet, I know how you're polluting it. Okay. So let me uh, just review quickly for you. What are we talking about when you say pollution heats the climate? Okay. I took a Uber to come here. When it burns, to give the power for your car, the fuel you put is what we call hydrocarbons. It's nothing but hydrogen and carbon attached together. Okay, it is, when you split it by lighting a fire, it releases energy and that energy pushes your car. So far, so good. Unfortunately, the, the carbon, when you split it from the hydrogen, combines with the oxygen to form this insidious gas called carbon dioxide. We all know about carbon dioxide. Nature produces it. It's not evil by itself, but when you have more of it, it's not good. It's like everything in life, right? You enjoy life, but when you take too much, that starts hurting you. So why is this a, a bad guy? The carbon dioxide which came out of my uh, car today would stay half of it for about 100 years or more. And 20% stays for 1,000 years. Okay? So what does it do in that period? Just travels around the planet, covers the entire planet like a blanket. For example, the carbon dioxide which came out of my car today would be over all of Africa, India, China, within about 20 days. It would be in the Antarctic and Arctic within about three to six months. So the carbon dioxide which came out of Mr. James Watt, the one who invented the new steam engine, is still here. So how much have we emitted? Two trillion tons. That's two followed by 12 zeros, unimaginable amount. Literally, about half of it is still up there. This is what 
Scripps Institution of Oceanography does. It's the world's leader in measuring that weight of carbon dioxide, which is above our head. That trillion tons is equivalent to 500 billion cars. Unfortunately, our eye cannot see a gas. If it had been a solid, we won't be able to see the sky. There's so much there. So what does it do? It covers the planet like a blanket. How does the blanket keep you warm on a cold winter night? The blanket doesn't give any heat to you. It traps your body heat. That's exactly what this blanket does. This blanket traps the infrared radiation heat coming from the planet. And it's inescapable quantum mechanics physics. There's nothing we can do to escape it. So that is the thickness of the blanket which I measured with the satellite. Until then, nobody had done that. At the time, you know, when I got into it in the 1975, scientists thought the main way we are heating the planet was this carbon dioxide. And then, you see, I had no experience with climate change science. I was this guy who did look at Mars and Venus, and his father told him, it's useless, go back to America. So I got into this field. I didn't know that scientists had already decided carbon, no other gas is heating the planet. So I stumbled into this discovery. This was uh, 75. So what I showed at, at that time, scientists had just started to talk about this chlorofluorocarbons. You might have heard it as CFCs. This is the gas which escapes from your propellers in an underarm deodorant, under a refrigerant. They showed this destroys the ozone layer. Since I had got training in quantum mechanics and physics, I knew any complicated molecule like this would trap heat. So I looked at the heat trapping effects of this. I was shocked. It was 10,000 times more potent than carbon dioxide. A ton of this would have the same warming effect as a 10,000 tons of carbon dioxide. So that started a whole cottage industry of other gases we are putting in the planet. And I would say about 50 to 60 percent of the science was done in America. And now our own people are calling this junk science, flawed science. Okay? The other thing is that, you know, I, I, by 1980, five years into this field, I became clear to me, oh my God, this is, could be huge. So I said, I still trust, didn't trust the science. I said, if this trust, science was true, you know, do you know how we check our scientific facts? We make predictions with them and then check the predictions. So I teamed up with another <clears throat> famous meteorologist, Ronald Madden, and we did highly mathematical studies. And he said, nature, climate changes on its own. In that sense, skeptics are right. We're not the only ones changing. Nature changes too. So when would we see this man-made signal above the noise? And we predicted it was year 2000, 20 years. At that time, the planet was cooling. People thought we were crazy. And it turned out in 2001 is when people looked at all the data and scientists declared, we are seeing a discernible warming. So I think I showed temperature records. You see, this is the temperature of the planet. It was cooling. We published this paper in 1980. And we said the warming, you would see it in 2000. And that's when the signal became large enough. All the skepticism you would face when you talk about climate change. I'm addressing those, and then I move on to the solutions. The other thing you hear a skeptic say is that, oh, you know, nature changes by itself. We're not the only ones changing, so natural, when we, anything we say fires, they say it's natural change. And the answer to that is, you're absolutely right. Climate changes on its own. I'm showing you how the planet's climate has changed over the last 60,000 years. This is 60,000 years ago. This is 10,000 years ago. This is now. So why is our change such a big issue? Nature goes cold, glacial, warm, cold, glacial. But it's peak temperature. We were in the peak temperature period already. And we are warming the climate beyond that. So 
we have already exceeded this chart. And if we collectively don't do anything about this, it's going to go off chart. When it goes on the top of that curve, which I'll show you when that's going to happen, it's not 100 years from now. We are talking about 20, 40 years. We would reach a climate which has not been seen in the last 10 million years. And imagine all the ecosystem. If it gets hot, I know what we will do. We'll go into a house, jack up the air conditioning. How about all the animals? How about all the plants? Either they will become extinct if they can't migrate, right? So yes, climate has changed quite a bit on its own. The reason the warming is so large, there are a lot of force multipliers. Okay, and Just to give you one example, this is the sea ice or the Arctic. 1979, the sea ice was here, pole is here. And when we looked at the data 2012, a third big chunk is gone. So you can ask, what's the big problem with it? just ice, polar bears? You know, we don't need the polar bears. How does the ice help us? Ice is white. Any white substance reflects sunlight. The darker the substance is, it absorbs more light. The ocean absorbs 90% of the sunlight hitting it. That's why the ocean is dark. Ice and snow reflects 90% back. Imagine that amplification. We have pumped enough heat into the Arctic Ocean, equivalent to dumping another 1 trillion tons of carbon dioxide. See, we emitted 2 trillion. The change is doing is amplifying it. There are about 10 amplification mechanisms like this. So uh, I have brought you up to speed on three quarter courses of mine on climate change science. So in 2017, the normally conservative American Meteorological Society, they looked at the past 20 year records of extreme weather and released this famous statement. It is too uh, drastic a statement for a conservative society. It says we are witnessing new weather extremes because we have made a new climate. They're able to link these fires we are speaking, which is spontaneously spreading. The hurricanes, others dumped feet of rain on Houston. And what you see in Puerto Rico, all of them would have been less drastic without climate change. So cl the warming of the planet acts as a force multiplier. We are not, so the skeptics are right. If you say that fire was caused by climate change, they're going to say no. California always had fires. But California never had fires which spread in six hours, wiped out 50,000 homes in campfire. That spontaneous spreading is because we have sucked up the moisture from everywhere in the planet with the heating. And because of this, I'm now saying we should call this not global warming, not climate change, it's climate disruption. This link between climate change and weather extremes has brought climate change directly into public health. I, I now, I know we had a meeting and we concluded in that meeting, yeah, climate change is impacting our polar bears, killing off our corals, doing this to the glaciers, but it's doing a lot more damage to human beings, homo sapiens. And just in 2017, 117 million were exposed to heat wave, extreme heat waves, more than 120 degrees temperature. So this is a, a statistics from the disaster agency. They looked at the last 20 years, 606,000 people died from climate change. Imagine that. And 4 billion people were injured, left homeless, were displaced, had to migrate. So it's no more a small problem. It's affecting billions. Here, what we concluded, the United Nations said, see, the planet is already heated by a degree Celsius. That's about two degrees Fahrenheit already. And the next degree warming in Fahrenheit, United Nations claimed was 2040. We looked at the same record and concluded 
No, it's going to happen 2030, 10 years from now. What does that mean? What is one degree? One degree is 50% of two degrees, so the warming is going to amplify by 50% in 10 years. Just let me tell you what it means for California. Analysis of the record which was published just six months ago by over three or four universities together showed from 1975 to 2015, 2018, California ADL extent of the fire increased by 400%. We're not talking about 5%, we're not talking about 10%, we're talking about 400%. So if you warm the planet another 50%, it is likely our fires would increase by another 200%. I think about all the people in the middle class, lower middle class, if they lose their fire insurance, they are just one fire away from homeless. That is where I, now, coming to faith meetings like this, I'm begging you all to get into the solutions. A lot of people are going to suffer. If society doesn't pay attention to this, I'm expecting in 10 years, when the warming amplifies at 50% and climate change moves into our living rooms, finally it will touch us. Hopefully our compassion genes will come in. And hopefully we won't say, oh, it's warming, I'll just increase my air conditioning. Right? But if you take the other route, I'm just going to protect myself. I can't worry about people living away from me. So by 2050, that warming can explode. Instead of one or two degrees, it's nine degrees Fahrenheit. And scientists have estimated seven billion people would be exposed to deadly heat or lethal heat waves. So how do we define deadly heat? Warming more than 125 degrees, lasting for a week or 10 days. I think uh, medical experts say at that stage, if you're not in an air-conditioned environment, you would perish. 20% of the species are threatened extinction, and the infectious disease would spread. Remember, right now, things like dengue, cholera, chicken, they're constrained in hot climates. So. Uh, certainly most parts of America would be exposed to all this. These are all coming from medical experts. So I, ha I have one, uh, one last disaster story, and then I move on to the good things, because I see around me worried faces. I want you to be happy and cheerful to join the fight, right? not get depressed. So when that hits, there's a 10% probability this is how the planet would look. All the brown areas are severe drought. You know, uh, vegetation can't survive. You know about the fires. Look at the Amazon. We are going to hear from uh, Bishop McElroy about the uh, historic meeting there this week. Look at the entire Middle East, I mean, uh, Mediterranean region. Nothing can grow. So this is the kind of a dystopian future we are talking about. So the question is, you know, uh, how, do, how does someone like me who has seen this unfold still continue to work on this? Honestly, without that email from St. John Paul II, I would have been in a deep, clinically depressed state. So I keep motivated. I personalize it. I have uh, three children. Two are married, I have four grandchildren. So if I say there is a one in 20 chance of this plane crashing, none of us are going to get on it. If I tell you it's a one in 100 chance, none of us will get on it. If I tell you it's one in 10,000 chance, we won't get on it. But we are sending our children and grandchildren on that plane. I see literally, you know, when I see this plane, the front one, my children are sitting there. 
my grandchildren are on the last plate. So that's what keeps me motivated. I said, no, 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 I can't give up on this. I got to keep fighting. So uh, it's not too late. There are plenty of scalable solutions. And we have about 10 years to implement these solutions. Okay? Two amazing things happened to me in 2014. One was I had a meeting at the Vatican, and I briefed Pope Francis in person. At the same time, I come back from this Vatican meeting. I, I honestly uh, felt divine intervention. And I felt charged. I said, yeah, we can. And then I get a call. I come back. I get a call from our president. Uh, and I say president. I'm not talking about the national president. I'm talking about president of the University of California, Janet Napolitano. <laughs> she called me and said, Ram, you're going all over the world. You're, you, know, you claim to be talking with the Vatican. Why don't you help us Just come up with some solutions? So I assembled 50 faculty from all 10 campuses, Berkeley, Los Angeles, UCLA. It was amazing. I may, our, our scientific community, we have come to the conclusion this is a disaster. I would say, you know, I can speak on behalf of many of but 50% of us, we clearly see that cliff there. So they just came in. I didn't have to tell them anything. I didn't have any money to offer them. If they come to a meeting, travel, they have to pay on their own and come. And we came up with this uh, solution set. So we put it under six pillars. The inside is science. It tells you what all the pollutants you have to cut. See, that's the thing. Science knows what to do. Science doesn't know how to do it. So that was my flawed thinking. I thought we scientists can solve it. Now I know. And uh, we need society's help. It's people who solve problems, not scientists. And amazing, this group of high power technologists, Nobel laureates, we came, the top thing we need is societal transformation. We are not acting on this problem because public has not woken up to the danger of this. There is so much noise around us. We are all busy. We have our children to take to schools. We have to make a living. And you throw this problem on them. What, what are they going to do? No, I don't want to deal with it. So that's our first. Of course, then governance, markets, an instrument. We had economists. We have to make them cost effective. And then we need technologies. We need to manage our ecosystem better, <laughs> okay? And we had detailed solutions, each of them. I cannot go through all of this. I'll just say on the science side, the most important action we can take is declare fossil fuels as outdated. Remember, before 1900, our technology was human power and horse and buggies. They served us well, but they came. Now the time for Fossil fuel is come. And renewables, we have the sun, we have the wind, we have the nuclear, we have geothermal, abundant of resources. So the question I'm always asked by economists is, oh, that's all fine, Ram, but who's going to pay for it? I just did this study with a German group. We released it in 2019. We found the air pollution coming from fossil fuel in the tailpipe smoke. That's killing three and a half million lives each year. America alone, fossil fuels directly kill, not to bring the fires, not to bring the floods. Directly, air pollution kills about 150,000. And if you look at how much an American is willing to pay for clean air and multiply this 150,000 lives, that's $1 trillion every year. Why are we mentioning that? I need exactly that one trillion to switch from fossil to renewables. So I tell the economists, we are paying for fossil fuel with our lives. We are paying for it with our houses. We are paying with it our well-being. Every time I see a fire, I put myself in that house. It will be the most traumatic experience to see your life's belongings burning away. Imagine the mental stress. But we, scientists like me, we are sitting in our ivory tower. 
We are saying, no, 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 market instruments, who is going to pay for it? It's going to bring the economy down. We need to talk about this in people's terms. That's where Lauda C comes. And that's where you know, the faith leaders assemble here, you come in. We don't have that language to talk about this problem in terms of ethical and moral dimensions. So the first, in societal transformation, I'm pushing three angles. First is form an alliance between science, religion, and policy. I talked about this to a bunch of academics actually at UC Irvine. I was surprised, I expected pushback. We had dinner afterwards. Everyone agreed that's the way to go. So you are not going to find any resistance from scientific community. So what is the entry point for religion here, faith leaders? There may be a number, I'm just giving one example. We are depending, I mean, I see the world as there are two worlds. One is I call top one billion where I'm inhabiting, right? We have unlimited access to everything and we are burning them away, not worried about our future. And that there's the poorest three billion, they lack access to fossil fuels, even for cooking. 2013, six years ago, I took a sabbatical to live in villages in India. I started from a village in South India, worked my way up to the Himalayas. And this woman, this is a village in, in, the, in the Himalayan foothills. And I was a guest in her house, and she's cooking my breakfast. She has not discovered fossil fuels, okay? I think the next one is a video, two minutes long. I'm gonna take you inside the two worlds, how we are living side by side. So this is in uh, North India. Early morning, she and her daughter are preparing uh, our breakfast. I must tell you the most delicious food. <laughs> and so, now I'm going to take you to middle of the day, around noon time. See how the smoke goes up. And they showed it's a smoke killing three billion women and children. So it's a daytime, we come back to her house, you see how pitch dark it is, okay? So when she is cooking for us, she has her son playing cricket. While the daughter is going to get fuel for the afternoon, evening meal. Then I followed to see where she was getting her, my water from. I got fixated on the frog. In the, she reassured me, sir, but I make sure there's no frog when I cook for you. And you see, the other thing is, she doesn't even have footwear. 20 kilometers from a village, this is this other world. Okay, look at this. And every 10 days, I would drift to these. Now I'm driving back to Bombay, passing through millions of slums. So this is the ocean front. You can see all the pollution, the haze. One person lives in that entire house, apartment. Now I'm going to show you, see? That is why we are not solving this problem. It took me six hours to drive from that village. And I, I, was, I used to cry many days, seeing this suffering. My wife couldn't take it, and she left me, but she came back to me afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> why did she leave? She was so upset because the women were doing all the work. And so she left angry with the men in the villages. I left angry with the whole system. After six hours, I completely forgot about them. I was able to enjoy my glass of beer sitting in a five-star luxury restaurant. So that's why you don't pass judgment on others. Our mind is, I think, hardwired to leave problems behind, and when that beer is there, forget about everything else, right? So after this, I, I organized a meeting at the Vatican 
on sustainable humanity, sustainable nature, our responsibility. That's an economist uh, from Cambridge. He works on poverty, Das Gupta. And that's Archbishop Minaras. He normally, when we organize a meeting, they will bring in a cardinal or an archbishop to organize the meeting with us. Archbishop Minaras adds our responsibility. Just a simple phrase, I till then didn't think of this as a problem I am responsible for. I thought I was helping by doing the science. Anyway, at the end of it, normally we go to the Pope's palace and brief the Pope. So I'm sitting there, standing there. That's a parking lot inside the Vatican, behind the Basilica. I'm imagining creating an atmosphere of this Pope's room and practicing my 20-minute presentation. Suddenly, a small car, I think it's a Fiat, gets up. And someone gets out of the car. He said, no, I know this person. <laughs> Turned up Pope Francis. I was a little bit disappointed. I thought you'd have a nice big impala getting out of that. <laughs> <Right? coughs> he came, come straight to us. And that day, it turned out, Time magazine was there. He, that was, remember, he became the hero of the farm. So I was just given two minutes. And I tell you, it was, I think of it as a divine intervention, because if I was given 20 minutes, I would have buried him in the details of this blanket, <coughs> CO2, hydrocarbons. So I only two minutes. I asked uh, Bishop Sorando, he's the chancellor of the academy. I said, Marcelo, how do you expect me to summarize two days of meeting in the Bell Laureates in two minutes? He said, Ram, just tell them what you told us. So I told the Holy Father uh, that, look, we are all here because we are worried about climate change. Then I told him the second sentence, which is, you know, uh, most of this pollution comes from the richest one billion people. And, and we all see the cliff. The first group is going to go down that cliff or three billion poor people who had nothing to do with this. So he was touched, and then he asked me in Spanish, what can he do about this? And Marcelo translated, so I told the uh, Holy Father that, look, uh, you have become the moral dealer of the world. And uh, I said, in your talk, every talk you give, just ask people to be good stewards of the planet. And I said a few more things, and then he laughed. Archbishop Mininath laughed. Others were laughing, so I was very upset. I said, I'm saying something serious. Why are they laughing? So as walking back, I asked Marcelo, or Archbishop, I forgot. I said, why were you people laughing? And, and they said, Ram, you are preaching to the Pope. <laughs> <laughs> Only God has that power to preach the Pope. <laughs> so then we wrote a paper, Das Gupta and myself, and I, 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 we made the statement, finding ways to develop a sustainable relation with our planet requires ultimately also a moral revolution. That's a huge admission for us scientists. We think all problems we can solve by technology, by science. And we said religious institutions can and should take the lead on bringing about such a new attitude towards creation. What did Pope Francis do with my two-minute pitch? It's not that he was not aware of this. He converted that into this beautiful, beautiful phrase, cry of the earth to be heard, the cry of the poor. Then we went to the you know, Paris summit. I was honored by Pope Francis sent to me as the science advisor to the Holy See delegation. Remember, his encyclical had just come out about five months before the summit. So we had a meeting with Nobel laureates and top scientists from Germany and Europe and US to review this document. Can we stand behind this document as scientists, one after one? This is the perfect document climate change. 
This is the Little Bee Meat Academy. You can see uh, Cardinal Turkson. He's the closest to the Pope. I think he helped the Pope write the encyclical. And I, I, I want to tell you other thing. This is what I tell my friends when I meet other religions. I say, you know, Catholics pay the most respect to scientists. See, they had all the cardinals sitting. We, the scientists were on the front row. And then he organized a meeting of uh, city mayors. That's the meeting where about one third of the mayors from around the world said, we are going to cut down our emissions. I had taken our governor, Jerry Brown, to that. I want to mention to you, I, the other uh, leader I have the good fortune and blessing to interact with this, uh, the Dalai Lama. So this was his 80th birthday. It was held in Anaheim. There were about 5,000 people. I was on the stage with His Holiness. That's Walter Monk, a famous scientist in uh, UCSD. But at the end of it, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, asked me, what do you want us to do? It's such a complex problem. So I told him, very simple, just clean the air. Don't put junk in the air. And then he looked at me. He said, how can you clean the outer environment without cleaning the inner environment? So the second thing is that how do we bring people? We have started an education program to teach our kids to be climate warriors. OK, the university loved this program, but they don't like the term warriors. Now that's too aggressive. Call them climate champions. <laughs> Officially, I say climate champions, but in my talks, I like the word warriors <laughs> because it's the biggest battle we are fighting. It has to be treated like that. In the part of education, I just want to mention one more thing that I knew in the US if we want to get majority, we can't do this without the evangelicals, right? They are the ones also hugely skeptical of the science. I must tell you, I have interacted with them so much. Their skepticism, I don't think they are wild. They are reasonable. Anyway, to this meeting, I am working with Reverend Leith Anderson. He is the president of the North American Evangelical Association. He was sitting on the uh, back pew there. Apparently, the first time a leader of the evangelical had come to the Vatican. I don't know this for sure, but that was what I was told. So he told us, uh, Reverend Lita Anderson, Ram, I've listened to all of you for two days. I agree this is the most serious problem, and we have to deal with that as leaders of the evangelicals. But he said, don't try to get us into your tent. You have too many other problems going there. I want to stay in my tent, but help me tell my people about climate change. So our education program, we have now created this. We have a course which is basically taped lectures by top experts. Students listen to the tape and come to the class to discuss solutions. When the students become the lecturers, we have a digital book going along with this. And you see my influence of the church. Normally, in my books and papers, I put you know, some scientific images, trees, forests. No, I put human face to give this a human dimension. It's us. And we have a book, and we're creating a MOOC. And we have tested it now. Eight, all eight university I mean, campuses in the UC, it's being taught in Taiwan. They said they'll help us take to China. And we are teaching it in Stockholm. They said they will try to help Europe. I think this is one area where we could partner with the uh, Catholic uh, religion. You run the best schools. Okay? I told you how I was carefree with no homework in India. When I was 10, my parents joined me in a Catholic school. My life changed. A lot of homework. <laughs> So, uh, and we, uh, I know in places in India, Catholic schools are one of the best. Not only schools, colleges. So I'm trying now to take this course, this so-called you know, red states, I'm working with Nebraska, Pennsylvania, and Texas. 
So uh, just keep that in mind. We would appreciate any help in taking this. This basically doesn't talk too much about climate change. Just one lecture. The rest is solutions. Empower them. Our solutions are just not technology. This is about movement. This is about caring for indigenous people, caring for the poor. And then, of course, we have economics, technology. So the other thing we are doing is holding a summit. I think this is my last slide. I now um, have the slogan. Like all my slogans, my university hates it. I say cradle to grave education. They say, Rav, do the cradle, cut the grave part of it. <laughs> but, so we are holding the summit. CSU, entire CSU is joined with this. Uh, and between CSU, California State University, University of California, we train 60% of the teachers. And we want this to talk all the way from pre-K to go to 12. So we are releasing a report and a curriculum that's happening in December. Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you.